Hi everyone, it's Paul, and welcome to Experience PRS 2021. This is a virtual event. It should be fun. It's going to be about two hours. But first, I want to talk to you about experience in general. We started it because we wanted to connect with people. It was a way for us to connect customers with dealers, with distributors, with artists, with players, with the media, and have them all mix. A little bit dangerous, actually, um, when, you first, when we first started it, but everybody made it work beautifully somehow. So we continue to do our experiences, and this one is going to be virtual today. Um, connection for us is very, very important. We want to connect to you. We want to connect to our dealers and our distributors and the media and you name it. We want everybody to be in the same pot, talking and sharing ideas and wanting to know what everybody thinks. And so this thing's been going on for about 15 years. When we did our first event, Everybody gathered in the tent and just wanted to talk about this experience that they'd had, and they didn't want it to go away. And artists had new guitars. Uh, I started giving my guitars away that day. I remember Al Timio looked at me and he says, I like this guitar. I like this guitar. Uh, can I have it for the Return of Forever Tour? I said, sure, I got a better one in the truck. Everybody laughed, but he took the guitar. And <laughs> I didn't miss it much, but I did miss it. Anyway. So Jack Higginbotham and Jamie Mann are going to talk more about all the events in a few more minutes with us. But today I wanted to talk about a State of the Union, kind of a what go, what's going on here. And once again, experience is an invitation to be inside our walls to get to know us better. Um, and for us, we change a lot. Change is constant. Um, but for us, we're trying to improve things. And one of the things I've done is I've studied guitar makers a lot. And since I can't talk to them on the phone, these people that started the industry when I was just being born, um, if you get a hold of one of their guitars, everything they thought is in that instrument that they made. What they thought was the best thing they can do is in that instrument. So if I get my hands on these old, old guitars that are magic, I can hear what they were thinking that day. And these instruments are the only way that I can talk to these guitar makers. So I'll draw from that, our company will draw from that, but we'll also draw from our own experiences and from our customers' experiences and from our dealers' experiences to change for the future. So we learn from the past and we change for the future and we're very clear. We stay guitar makers. We're not looking to just build a brand. We're guitar makers making instruments, making amplifiers for you, making guitars for you. And we're quietly making improvements all the time. And all this improvement making is leading to making positive change to our instruments and our amps. And, so, and some of the changes you don't see, but we're always trying to do a better job. And some things never change. I've never changed Let's show you here. I've never changed the theory about where to put the frets in. Um, we've never changed the headstock shape, although artists have us do a little thing, little things to them. Um, kind of the theory about how we put the necks in has never changed. There's a lot of things that haven't changed. The birds are the same as I started with, although we do modifications to the birds. Um, and we are doing slight modifications once in a while to headstock shapes. So if we've got to make a 12 string, it's going to be longer. If we've got to do a 7 string, it's going to change a little bit. And lately we've been working in depth on a lot of new things, which I wanted to go over with everybody. So TCI is a new thing for us. Uh, it's a way of trying to explain a tuned capacitive inductive circuit. So if you have a single coil guitar, um, you can hear the same note in all the notes that you play. The pickup kind of has a whistle note to it. And we've got a piece of test equipment that can tell us exactly what that whistle note is, how loud it is, exactly what uh, frequency it's at. And what happens is that we can then have a really good idea of what the pickup's going to sound like before we ever plug it in. And this TCI thing's going very well for us. The other day, there was a recording that I had, and somebody said, that doesn't sound like a humbucker, Paul. But it was a humbucker, and we were able to learn how to tune the pickup with the special equipment we have. 
this equipment is very sensitive and what we're doing to the pickups is very sensitive. There's been a hundred tries over the years at certain kinds of pickups and they all sound a little different. If it was if it wasn't sensitive they'd all sound the same but they all sound a little bit different and for us that sensitivity is part of the TCI thing that we're able to tune it exactly the way we want. We're also starting to do TCI and amps and we've got test equipment here that we're starting to be able to see exactly how the amps going to sound before we ever plug into it which is cool. Another example would be finish and our Maryland made guitars are switching over to nitro. Now nitro is a it's like a cocktail at a bar, you know, it, they may say you're getting this kind of shooter, but it has a different amount of sugar in it, different amount of this, different amount of alcohol, different amount of this. And the basic part for nitro is the resin. And we have a very good material now, a good material that doesn't yellow very much, doesn't stay soft, it dries well. If we want it to crack intentionally over time, we can make it do that. If we want it to never crack, we can do that. It has very good adhesion. And those problems that are normally associated with nitro, we are doing a very good job with, and I'm happy about it. There's a balance to the instrument. There's a nice tone to the instrument. The, the finish feels really good, and we're switching over to that. And I didn't want to switch over to it until we had a material that we really liked that we could rely on long term and we've got that. Another example of something that we're always changing is neck shapes. So when you pick up a guitar, it's one of the first things you feel. How does the neck feel? And we have our own terms for neck shapes, whether it be wide, thin, or pattern, regular, or pattern, or our vintage pattern neck, or whatever it is. We don't use normal industry terms. We use the terms that we grew up with. You know, we thought that was a wide fat neck, so that was the name that we gave it. Whereas other people would say a D shape or a V shape or this or that. Mostly we have our own terms, but we're getting, once again, really, really good at the shape of these things to be consistent over and over and over again. Really pleased about that. We're always improving it, but it is the first thing you feel on the guitar. Another example would be the acoustic sound of the guitar. Now I know that the internet theory is the acoustic sound of the electric guitar doesn't matter at all and it's only the pickup. But I don't buy it. So if that was true, a semi-hollow guitar like a 335 or one of our semi-hollows would make no difference in the electric sound at all. But the, the world knows that having a semi-hollow guitar does make a difference in the tone of the guitar regardless of what you put, pickup you put in it. And our theory here is to get as many harmonics out of the instrument as possible and have the strings ring as long as they possibly can before you ever put the pickup on the guitar. And I think that that's going well and we've been making improvements in that. You know, for artists, our job is that if they have a big boat of guitars on the side of the stage, they reach for our guitar first. That's our job. And we see it as us making tools for the musicians as good as we can possibly make a tool for somebody to make their music on. And in those tool tools for musicians, we now have two new artist models. So I want to show you. This is the uh, new Joe Walsh guitar that we're doing. And then here's the new Fiore, the Mark Lettieri guitar. And um, <laughs> as fast as the Joe Walsh guitar is sold and as many backwards as we got for the Lateria guitar, I'm really proud to have these new artists with us. It's great. So we don't have any new products today, but we do have one new product update. And if you've been watching, thank you, Judy. If you've been watching uh, Last Train Home video that's on the Saab Rock, CD that John Mayer's coming out, he's been holding a pink silver sky. And as of right now, I'm announcing, although I think John kind of beat me to it with the uh, thing that he posted this morning of the pink PRS logo. This is a Roxy pink silver sky. It comes in rosewood only, and you know, I really like it. And to watch John play it in that video, I was very proud because he was getting a gorgeous tone out of it. It was fun. Um, these come in Rosewood only, and that is it for our new products. Here, I'll hold on to this thing. We're good. 
With all that said, I want to give you a real overview of our business. We are what we call an integrated business. We build from scratch, all the way from buying logs to all the marketing and sales stuff. We do it all from the ground up. We're not an assembly house. We don't order necks, order bodies, and just put them together here with pickups from someplace. We're making it all here. And from day one, it was important to me that we had some real say in how we dried the woods, how we glued them together, um, how uh, we finished the guitars, how we wound the pickups. It was all important. And well, the pickups are a good example. If there's an artist here, we can change the pickup in the, to their desire in half an hour, not three weeks of ordering it. And it was really important that we could do things quickly and accurately and in-house. So for us, PRS gives this group of 400 people an ability to be good at what we're good at. It's enjoyable to uh, have a job where you can thrive and be good at it. And watching the people build the guitars here is a joy. I uh, was brought down on the floor today to check two guitars, one for the extraordinary artist Jimmy Herring and one that I had built out of spare parts for me. And then, you know, I get to do that six, seven times a day, I'm down on the floor working, and we get to be good. This whole place gets to be good at what we're good at. So there are a lot of teams here at PRS. We've got our teams of employees, whether it be in building the guitars, finishing the guitars, putting them together, making them in the wood shop. We've got teams of people in marketing. We've got teams of people in artist relations. We've got teams of people in the repair shops. We've got teams of people in finance and sales. You name it, there's teams all over this place. And we have teams of people on the road helping to sell the guitars. And we've got this huge dealer network, distributor network, and partners all over the place whether it be woodcutters, you name it. There's a very, very large community of employees and partners that make this thing happen. So, thank you for watching. By the way, there's been a very high demand for our guitars over the last year. You know, people at home and wanting to play guitar and that want for our instruments and our products over the last year and the back order that we carry I want to thank everybody, and I'm very, very appreciative. So, that's an overview. Welcome to Experience PRS 2021. Here we go. Two hours. Let's go. here to fill in a couple of holes that Paul Smith may have left for us and we may refill a few of those holes. He hit on some good stuff. But uh, I want to go back to the beginning of experience and go to 2007 and the original thought around that show was never realized quite honestly because the original thought was kind of Woodstock and the, the weird thought that I had was all of the green areas around our factory filled with tents and people hanging out for two weeks and it was just going to be this glorious thing of impossibility. That didn't happen, but the premise of that did happen. So there were some foundational ideas that we had 
that were there that first year and have continued every year since. And we have found ways to virtually incorporate that inside of this event for this year. So some of those things are interactive, educational, and experiential. Um, and regarding experiential, what we have always wanted was for you to have an opportunity to experience who we are, for you to get to know us. And in 2007, I don't think the public at large knew us all that well, not us as a business. Um, so that was a big deal to open the doors and let people come in and actually intermingle and get to know who we were a little bit. That also gave us an opportunity to understand who you are and what you want and what your desires are in guitars and where we can provide something for you, you know, given the information that you give to us. And we want to be able to show you why we do what we do and how we do what we do. Um, and as Paul said, our main goal is to make tools for musicians. And to take it a step further, I look at it also as making an inspirational tool that will allow you to bring your art to life, that our guitars can be a conduit to the music that's inside of you. And if we do our jobs well, and all of that manufacturing technique goes in and we execute those plans perfectly, we've made a tool that allows that to happen a little bit better for you. And that's why, that's basically why we are here. Yeah, Jack, and uh, so you were here in the very beginning of, of the experience. I missed the first one, but I was here for the second one. And you know, my experience with experience is, is just that it, the people, the relationships, and the sharing of all the things that you just talked about, it's just, it's a really magical event for us. Uh, we thoroughly enjoy putting it on and being part of it. Um, and we hope that you guys enjoy it as well. We have 400 plus employees now, so mm -hmm. you know we're growing like crazy. It's a great opportunity for them to you know also be a part of what we're doing here. Um, but on top of the 400 employees, getting those tools, as you call them, you know, out to out to the public and out to the guitar players, it takes much more than just the employees here. I mean, the employees we're super proud of. It's, we have a great team here. But we also have dealers, and Paul touched on this earlier, we have yeah. dealers, distributors, we have media, we have all of our supply partners, we have bankers, we have lawyers, we have artists who are pushing us in all sorts of directions all the time. We have influencers and we have you, the guitar players, as all part of our community and network. And, right. and you know, Paul did touch on this, that I just, I love the fact that we can get all these people together, um, thank them, let them know how much you appreciate and open the curtain and say, you know, the guys, this is what's happening inside, and this is what we do. And, and the interaction between all the different groups of our community or friends of the business, as we call them, is just, it's a really special feeling to see all of these people interacting together. Um, so we, uh, you know, through the appreciation, like you said, we're, we, we share music, we share food, we share meaningful clinics, we give insight to the product that's coming up, we hopefully have a couple laughs, um, and, and hopefully it comes out that you're able to see how much we love what we do and that comes through it's our pleasure to share it with you we love sharing these things with you and we really look forward to it another thing i just wanted to i just there was a moment when i first toured the factory so it was two years before i started here so we had been talking a little bit about me joining the company yeah. and um, i came through the factory and i just remember looking in the hot rooms outside of top coat and just being in awe of the beauty and the colors and the craftsmanship and you had that smell of wood and yep. you know the machines you know are cutting and you just I love that smell and just you know I'll never forget that moment you know just wow I've been around manufacturing forever but this was special yeah. and you know hopefully you know through our experience you know this is virtual so you're not going to smell the wood but hopefully you get a feel for how much we love this place all the things we do and you know we look forward to opening the doors and doing it again in the future. But it's just that, that feel of this place that, that I think still is magical that we yeah. like to share. Yeah, totally. So for virtual experience, we take a cue again from the things that we've learned that you love when you come here and come to experience. So some of those foundational things, one is an artist clinic. So our artist clinics, when we announce the roster and the artist clinic schedule goes up, you can watch forums and understand 
how much impact that has because people are basically building their weekends around the clinics and saying, I want to be with you at this clinic and then we're going to go to this one and this one and this one. And it basically maps out 48 hours for them. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that we know that people appreciate and, and that people like very much. There was one clinic in particular that I just happened to be walking through the factory when it was going down and it was David Grissom in our rough cut and it was a fairly early on experience, but he was teaching a master class, I believe, in transposition. So he had staff paper and charts up in front of him. He had an audience of 50 or 60 people in front of him. Everybody had staff paper and they're making notes and they're, they're doing notations. And the, you could see just this laser focus. Everybody was very connected to David, very into what was going on a bomb could have gone off in that room and I don't think anybody would have flinched because they were just dialed into yeah. what was going on. And I, I remember thinking, I wish I wasn't working right now because mm -hmm. I would like to just sit here and absorb this mm -hmm. thing. And a bunch of other clinics that have happened. So we know those things are really important. This year we have a virtual artist clinic session, uh, two great artist sessions with several great artists. Um, we think you're going to get a lot out of these sessions mm -hmm. today. So Jack, the other thing that is always fun about the, uh, the experience of the tours. So we yeah. have guided tours and we have self-guided tours. Um, what Judy and the gang have done here is really awesome. So they've taken, they've taken the tours and sort of simulated the self-guided portion of that. So on the self-guided tour, you're gonna go to a station, the manager's gonna talk about what's going on. You're gonna have somebody doing work on a guitar and it's, you know, it's a nice personal experience. So they've done a really cool job of of simulating what, what a self-guided tour could be virtually. So yeah. the managers are gonna talk through what's happening and we've got you know some folks you know doing the activities on the guitar. And rather than go through the whole factory, uh, we have whole factory tours for you guys to find other places on the website, but it's a deep dive into four areas. Well, six areas now. So we, we added two after that. So we have, uh, we have the body team manager, uh, Max. So he's gonna take, uh, take everybody on a deep dive through neck setting. Um, so you're gonna see all of the detail and care and attention that goes into setting that neck and huge emphasis on full contact. You know, so Paul says we're always trying to improve, we're always trying to improve, but one of those things that we're always working on is full contact between the wood surfaces. So you'll see how much effort and energy goes into making that happen on every guitar. Um, then Mark Carroll's gonna take us through almost a magic trick of taking a two-dimensional object and making it three-dimensional. So Walter, Walter's doing the work, Mark's, Mark's talking us through it, but you're gonna see a sand out stain job on a fire red that is absolutely outstanding. And you'll see all the steps that go into bringing that brilliant curl into that third dimension, which is really fun to watch. Uh, Josh Davis is going to uh, take us through top coat. Uh, we have Austin Mark Amp guitar. You're gonna look at a guitar I don't think anybody is going to see the imperfections that are on this guitar, but Austin marks the heck out of it with, I think, 25 marks of that needs work, that needs work, that needs work. You can't see it, but he's, you know, he's looking at everything on that guitar. I can't see it in person, much I less know. on video. <laughs> Those guys are good. I know. It's, it's bright lights and, and super attention to detail. Carrie's going to take us through final assembly, and once again, a lot of emphasis on full contact and you know, face-to-face -face contact of all the components to transfer that tone. And then um, Doug Shive's gonna take us through the SE inspection. Yep. So hopefully you guys know this, but every guitar that comes into the US or goes into other areas of the, the world, they're all inspected and set up. And so we don't just you know, take SEs from factory and put them on shelf. We make sure they're ready to go, out of the gig bag, ready to go. Yep. Uh, so Doug's gonna take us through that and then, then um, Doug Sewell's gonna give us a great walkthrough of the development of the amplifier process. The process of developing amplifiers and putting them together, bringing them from concept, and how they work together with Paul and bring those to market. Yep. So it should be a lot of fun to watch. It should be, and I think the self-guided tours, to your point, I think that's probably the most popular thing that yeah. happens here. People yeah. love that, so this will be a, a cool way of doing that. Another thing that we do every experience or we have uh, for most of them is a jam stage um, and I had a lot of fun the first two years I think that we had a jam stage I got to be a part of the house band and it was a blast interacting with all of you guys coming up playing guitar 
calling a tune, us trying to figure a tune out real fast, or you thankfully playing a tune that we knew, which was mm -hmm. better. Um, and that's morphed into a much better band that's the house <laughs> band that sits, sits while you guys play. But this year we have um, an interactive version and it's very tough to pull off an interactive jam stage. So what we have are artist jam breaks. So we've got groups of artists laying down rhythm tracks for you to play along with, but jamming by yourself isn't that much fun. So the best I can think of to suggest is either, hopefully you've invited a bunch of friends into your house already and that they're gathered around you and they can just like be in awe of you as you play. And if you haven't thought to do that, I suggest like open a window and turn your cabinet around and stick the cabinet out the window, <laughs> dime the amp, and make a bunch of friends and impress people because <laughs> that is what will happen. So uh, that's what you're going to do during I'll the jam you section. You're gonna yeah, they're going <laughs> to love you, and you're going to love it. So that's what you should do. So another thing we do every year at the Experience is we raise money with Hopkins. So we have a very close relationship with the uh, Kimmel Cancer Center. Uh, since 2000, we've raised more than $3 million. Yeah. Um, and we work, we, look, we don't just work with them closely at Experience. It's a, you know, we have a very tight relationship with them on all sorts of fronts. Um, so we do, uh, we work with their Living Cancer Resource Center. Yeah. So that's a supportive care group. They, uh, they take care of housing, transportation, legal, spiritual support for patients and their families. Um, so this year, we have two ways that you can help us support the, uh, the Kimmel Cancer Center. Uh, one is through a virtual tip jar, which will be live on the website through Sunday. So uh, you'll find that on the experience page. Uh, another thing, Joe Walsh, has uh, he has put a package together uh, that will be available in Reverb. Right. So once again, you can follow the link uh, through the website. But we have a PRS McCarty 594, single cut Joe Walsh limited edition guitar from his personal collection which will include a note from Mr. Walsh, and included in the package is an Eagle Super Deluxe Limited Edition box set. It's kind of incredible. It is pretty incredible. That's Somebody's awesome. gonna be very happy with that, with That's that package. That's pretty awesome. Yep. So, another thing we're doing is we have, we're doing polls on our Instagram stories, and we want you guys to all weigh in on it. So, at the end of the day, Paul's gonna come in in a couple hours or however long it takes, and he's trying to try to guess where you chose. So hopefully you can stump him because I think that would be good to throw him a couple of curveballs. Um, but, but give it a shot, get out there and weigh in on some of these questions. I, I breezed through them with Judy a little while ago and they're, they're surprising. They, they were kind of fun to answer. So probably the last thing that we want to talk about is experience. Another last thing that experience gives us the opportunity to do is to thank people. Mm -hmm. And we, um, it gives us an opportunity at some point to stand on a stage, grab a microphone, and thank you guys for supporting what we do because you are, you make our world go around. If you aren't enjoying what you're doing, if you're not appreciating what we're all trying to pull off inside of this place, you know, we're back, you know, washing dishes and, and putting asphalt shingles on roofs. Um, so your support not only helps us to do what we're doing, but it inspires us to do what we do. Um, when we are able to have experience in person and do tours, I will tell you, for me, to give a factory tour to you guys is one of the most energizing things I've, I've ever done. So, um, you know, we really appreciate you and we really appreciate the support that you give our company. Um, yeah, we, we want to thank not only the audience here and our, our, our community and our friends of the business like we talked about, but also just we got a shout out to, to our teams here. Uh, super big thanks to Judy and the team for pulling this together. Uh, Bev and the Artist Relations Group for, for supporting this activity. Uh, Don and the manufacturing team for putting up, you know, putting up with all the videos on the floor and uh, distractions as they're uh, under a lot of pressure to make more guitars every day um, and the entire PRS crew. So, you know, yeah. thanks to all, you know, the gang in this room and the gang outside. Great job once again pulling all this together and you guys are professional and top notch. Great job. Pretty awesome. Yep. So the last 18 months, we don't want to dwell on the bad, but yeah. the last 18 months inside of our business, like many of other people's businesses, has been very unusual. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that was pretty amazing is 
through the shutdown that we experienced about this time last year, I think you and I spent a lot of time together in a Lots conference room <laughs> and just looking at options on how to navigate and stuff. And one of the things we also were trying to do was to send out a lot of communication to the employees to give encouragement to people. But the shocking thing that I think I came away with was I think that the employees here gave us as much encouragement mm -hmm. as we were trying to give them. And I don't think that's normal. And I think it's just another beautiful thing about PRS Guitars and just want to thank all of the people as mm -hmm. Paul has and as Jamie has, just all of the people inside of the PRS team yep. for being who you are and making making this place go around. It's it's the public support and the PRS tenacity that makes us who we yeah. are. Yeah, so on Fridays while we were shut down, so some of us were in here doing some things to keep everything, you know, rolling. We had permission from the state to do all that. <laughs> but so, you know, we were in here, but we would put on a Zoom every Friday. And, and I tell you, it got to the point where I was really so looking forward to that. It was Just awesome. to interact. We had, you know, several hundred people on the Zoom call. Zoom happened. You know, hour. people were drinking their beer, having their scots, having their whiskey, whatever they were doing on a Friday afternoon. And, and it really was just, you know, it's the tough times to bring everybody together. Yeah. And it, it really worked that way. Yeah, it's been awesome. We have awesome. a great group here. So I think you're, I think you're going to enjoy yep. a good night tonight. There's a couple other things that we've got going on. For one, if you go to concerts, you get your T-shirt. You come to Experience, you get your T-shirt. Thanks to us. We decided to do T-shirts. We've got T-shirts. So we have the Experience 2021 T-shirts. Um, so you can go online and grab one of those. That would be awesome. Uh, and I think Jamie and I are going to uh, go Exit grab stage laptops. right and uh, join chat. We'll be on the chat, so yep. ask us some questions. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Somebody sit in the chair. Yep. Yeah, walk in, sit in the chair. And The downstairs of the PRS Guitar Factory is home to our electric guitar production line. From the raw wood to final assembly, this is where uh, PRS guitars are made. Back in 1985, Paul Reed Smith started our business in an attic. Today, we have 80,000 square feet of workshop dedicated to building quality tools for musicians. Our shop is broken out into specialized teams trained in each process of guitar building. Today, we're going to focus on a few select build processes here at PRS, including neck and body assembly, stain, fret level, turnaround, and final assembly. We're excited to show you what we do. This is from the factory floor. Maryland Made Electrics. Hope you enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Max Elchek and I am the first shift body team manager. Uh, today, we are gonna be looking at the NBA process. Let's get into it. So here we are in the wood shop, uh, looking at our NBA area. This is smack dab in between our rough sand and our finished sand for the body team. Uh, these guys are taking fully sanded bodies and fully sanded necks that have been matched up to orders. Uh, they are then going to take them and build them into guitars. So it's really where it comes to life and, and becomes a, a little bit closer to a usable instrument. All right, so here we have Jack. He is going to perform the first step in this NBA process, and that is cutting the heel to fit the neck pocket. It is something that he makes look pretty easy, but it really does take a lot of skill and precision to, to make sure that every, every spec that we have is, is nailed down to the thousandth. Uh, these neck pockets and heels are cut in the, mach the machines that are very, very accurate, but they're made out of wood, which is a very inconsistent material. So there's always a little bit of play each guitar is different and it really is down to Jack to make sure that it's a nice solid fit with no gaps. Uh, he's also going to be checking a couple specs here. Uh, first up is our neck angle. He uses a nice long straight edge there along the neck and a six inch ruler and he's checking the height of that neck angle off of the bridge. And that's just going to give us an idea of, of where the, the neck is going to sit in relation to the body and whether or not he needs to take more off on the heel to adjust that angle. So you can see him kind of going back and forth here with that straight edge and the six inch ruler just to make sure that it's absolutely dialed. Uh, it really makes a big difference with the setup uh, of the guitar and bridge height and everything else kind of falls into place. So now we have this next jig here. This is our neck alignment jig. He's making sure that the neck is set up from left to right. 
and making sure that our reveal is correct. So that is the height of the neck in the pocket there. So if everything checks out, which it does, he moves on to the next step. So here we're watching him score the, the heel. And that's just so that we get a nice uh, mechanical bond as they build this guitar. He's gonna score the heel and the inside of the neck pocket. Uh, a couple different woods here, mahogany and maple, and they're gonna react to glue differently. So you need to make sure that the, that the glue can penetrate the maple and get a nice bond. So here, Jack's putting his initials in just to make sure that he has credit for the guitar. It, it, it lets us have accountability for any quality issues, but it really is also kind of that, that point of pride for a, a job well done. So once Jack is done cutting the heel here, Sam is gonna pick up the next step. He is gonna be building the guitar for us, gluing it up and clamping it, making sure everything is set right. So the first step here, he double checks Jack's work, make sure he's got it all in line. These guys really do a good job. Uh, and part of that is holding each one accountable. All three of them work as a really nice team here. All right, if it checks out, he moves on to the next step here, spreading glue inside the neck pocket. He's gonna have a nice even layer on the bottom, left and right side of the neck pocket and some glue spread on the heel of the neck itself as well. So good coverage is really the, the, the critical aspect in this bond. Any air or any pockets just create an opportunity for moisture or movement or anything that can really damage the longevity of this joint here. We're looking for stability. That is number one. We don't want any movement. And the best way that happens is by a nice mechanical bond with no opportunity for moisture or anything to penetrate that. So once he's got the neck seated with the glue in there, he's gonna come in and clean up any excess squeeze out. They try and do a good job of using just the right amount of glue, but there's always gonna be a little bit extra. Next up, once it's cleaned, he grabs some uh, clamps with some purpose-built adapters here to really make sure that we're distributing the pressure across the surfaces that we're gluing up here. So a big one on the back and a nice one across the, the, the heel in the pocket of the guitar. Always more glue to clean up too. It really goes a long way. That glue can play nightmares uh, on the staining crew. If any of that is left in the pores of the guitar, it's gonna affect how the stain looks. So it really is critical that it's nice and clean. All the pores are nice and open and ready for that stain. So all the guitars sit for 30 minutes here while the glue sets. Uh, you can see we've got a couple other clamps on there as well, just to make sure that it's a nice stable while it's waiting. When it's ready to go, Jack here is gonna pull it off unclamp it and do some final cleanup. But first, check that neck angle again. There's always opportunities for things to move around, especially when working here, so the more checks, the better. A Little bit more glue cleanup here, and that's gonna make our sanders lives easier. Believe it or not, that is a normal toothbrush. <laughs> Sometimes the simplest tools are the best. So we use uh, a UV light here. The, the glue that we use reacts in the light to, to be a nice bright neon white. So it makes it a lot easier to see. Uh, a lot of times that glue just kind of sits in with some of the lighter colored maple. So it, it, it's a little tough to pick out, but the light helps us out a lot. So Jack is handing off the guitar to Tim. Tim is one of our finished sanders and definitely one of the more experienced workers in the, the body team and in the wood shop here. He's checking for glue once again, and really that experience is both in, in his hands and in his eyes, right? So years of, of fundamentals of, of, of training, sanding, and working on product lets him correct any scratches, any shape issues, round over edges so that they're nice and comfortable to play while also keeping an eye out for any quality issues. This is really one of the last chances before it moves to final check to, to fix some of the bigger shape issues or any problems that are found. So it's really important that it goes through experienced hands so they can catch those things and, and again, make the job of the next person in line just that much easier. As Tim finishes up with the guitar, he's gonna do a pre-QC check and really that's just another opportunity for him to find any issues so he's gonna look at it in the light here and give it one last look over before Nick picks it up. Nick here is our final QC check. He's part of a, a, a two-man team that checks every single guitar that leaves the wood shop. 
So one of Nick's greatest tools are his bench lights here. They're set in very specific locations to cast light across the guitar just how he wants it. And he's gonna use that to look at the shadows as they roll across the guitar. Those shadows really tell the story of any inconsistencies. And again, we're looking for minor, minor scratches because any of those scratches or swirls will show up when the guitar is stained. It needs to be very, very clean. So he's doing that last look over the area that Tim sanded on, making sure it's good to go. And he's gonna then progress to look over the entire guitar. He really manipulates the guitar in a way that allows him to use those lights to spot every nook and cranny, whether that's up on the headstock, down in the neck joint area. Here we see him flipping the guitar over just to get it in the perfect orientation with these lights, really making sure he can see every bit of the wood. And we're just looking for clarity. The, the more clear that grain is, the, the better it'll take stain. You're never gonna truly sand every scratch out. It's a, a game of hiding it. And really, the, the smaller the scratches and the more with the grain they are, the, the easier they are to hide, right? Nick's gonna sign it here, and that is the final QC check. He's gonna put it on the rack with the rest of the core guitars here and roll it off to finish hall when they're all set and done. In the finish hall, the next step of this guitar's life is stain. It's gonna get some color that's gonna pop and look amazing. Mark Carroll's gonna take you through that process. Hi, my name is Mark Carroll. I am the Bass Coat Production Manager with Paul Reed Smith Guitars. I've been with the company for 15 years now. And today, we're gonna to take a look inside the stain department, and we're gonna watch Walter staining a Custom 24 in the fire red color. So Walter has grabbed a guitar from the wood shop area and he's got to prep the guitar first for the stain. He's applying the tape to the fingerboard, the veneer, and he'll also do the hand carve. This prevents stain from getting on the areas of the guitar you do not want stain. The tape line that he's taping right now is very important to get very, very tight. Um, any bleed in this area will prevent the guitar from moving forward. It will not pass QC standards. He's also putting the yellow taper on the side, as you could just see, uh, so that he can put a small layer of isolator around the guitar. Right now, he's applying water to the top of the guitar that's going to have the stain applied to it. And this opens the wood a little bit so that it'll accept the stain a little better. He's now applying that isolator to the binding. What this does is it keeps the stain from bleeding through the top into the binding. Um, if that does occur, the guitar cannot move forward past the QC stage. <laughs> He's now applying the first coat of the fire red, which we refer to as charcoal. He has to ensure that an even coat goes over the entire guitar or it could create blotchy appearance. Walter's moving pretty quick right here. However, it takes us about six months to get the average employee up to speed before they're on their own to do this process. Quality and training are very important to us at PRS Guitars. We start employees on the easier colors before having them work their way up to the more difficult stains, including sand outs and stain fades. Once this step is done, he'll let it dry for approximately 15 minutes before the next step. The next step, he'll have to sand the, gu the guitar color out. This step has to be done very evenly, or again, it will create another blotchy appearance. Taking too much out will create a stripped look. And taking too little out will create, again, a blotchy appearance. Doing the sand out actually creates more of a contrast. Now he's applying the orange tiger color. The Orange Tiger is a water-based stain. The first coat was actually an alcohol-based stain. 
Again, he's applying this being very carefully not to go over the edge. If you were to go over the edge, it could create problems for the area after stain. If he was stopped right now, this would actually be Orange Tiger. Now Walter's removing the excess stain from the rag so he can do the hand carve. Leaving too much stain in the rag could create bleeding underneath of the tape, which would be a problem down the line and would not pass QC inspection. Fire Red is actually a three-part stain. It's going to have an oil-based stain applied lastly to the top. Walter's wiping any excess stain off so that it doesn't get puddled and create blotchy appearance. When Paul started the company in 1985, he had three colors. Now we have dozens of colors with over a hundred different variations. We're still experimenting every day with new colors and we encourage employees like Walter to come up with new colors. Walter's continuing to wipe any excess oil off of the guitar. This must be removed before it goes to its next step. Now Walter's going over the guitar to quality check his own work to make sure he didn't leave any stain where it's not supposed to be. While he's doing this, he'll also make sure that the wood shop didn't miss anything in their QC checks. Once this is completed, he'll hang the guitar up and it'll go into the spray room where it'll get an isolator coat to seal everything in. Then it'll get grain fill to fill in all the wood pores on the back and sides, including the neck. Later down the line, this guitar will have a dark burst and that'll complete its color coat. Now I'm gonna turn you over to Josh Davis who will walk you through fret level and turnaround. My name is Josh Davis. I'm the top coat manager for Paul Reed Smith Guitars. I've been working here for 15 years now. Today we're going to get into the fret leveling process, so let's get to it. The fret level process is important to the guitar because it affects the playability and the comfort level of the guitar when playing it. So right here Bobby's removing the tape to be able to start the leveling process. So right here Bobby puts double sided tape on the guitars to protect it so we don't get any cunny grooves in it with sandpaper. Bobby takes a straight edge puts it on the fingerboard and makes sure it's completely straight for the top sticking process. And he's looking through to see if there's any light passing through the ruler to make sure that the board is completely flat. Once the board's flat, Bobby takes 220 grit sandpaper and sticks the side of the frets to knock the hard ed edges off of it. Paul Smith created those sticks. They're acrylic sticks and they're designed to not bend so they stay straight but we take the sticks back to the flat stone every week to make sure that they stay flat. Right here, Bobby's taking Sharpie and putting it on top of the frets. So when we stick the top of the frets, you'll see if there's any high frets or low frets. So here's Bobby doing short strokes across the top of the fretboard to knock the frets down. He's using 320 grit sandpaper to even everything out. Then he takes a sanding block, goes over top of the frets to help take off those harsh 320 scratches to smooth the frets out. When he's done that, you go back over it with a razor blade and you clean off any finished residue that's on the fretboard. That way you get that nice clean rosewood. You have to take the razor blade and put it underneath the frets so you can pick any finish off that may be underneath of it. So then Bobby goes back over everything he just scraped and does long, smooth strokes to be able to get all those short scratches out of the fretboard. Basically, it's more aesthetic. It's, it's more part of the aesthetic so you don't see the harsh razor blade scratches in the rosewood is why we go back over it with long, smooth strokes on the fingerboard. So then Bobby goes back over the side of the frets and the top of the frets with a super fine pad to knock off any more hard scratches and to help smooth the fretboard out for playability. Bobby has overhead lights and then we also have dock lights. That way you can see any imperfections that might be in the fretboard itself. 
So after the fret level process is complete, you go back over the frets with 600 grit and then 1000 grit with a flat marble block to top the frets. If the frets aren't completely flat with the topping block, then you'll get buzz when you're trying to play notes and tones. So after the fret level process, the guitar goes through our wet sand process. After it's wet sanded, it gets buffed and heads to the turnaround and repair process. We call this part of the factory turnaround. It's called turnaround because you pick the guitar up and inspect it, and then you physically turn it around in the rack. That way we know it's ready for the next process. So we use hyper white lights in this area. That way the employees are able to see anything that's wrong with the guitar. So right here, Austin's marking up any kind of pinhole, sink, burn, any imperfection, scratches left over from buff to be able to get the guitar cleaned up to its final state. A lot of these things you're not able to see to the untrained eye, but people like Austin have been here for many years and are trained to be able to do this. We mark the guitars up with a wax pencil. Depending on the color of the guitar, depends on the color of the wax pencil. That way you can see what's wrong with it. For example, a white guitar, you use black wax pencil. On a red guitar, you use a white wax pencil. So if it has straight scratches on it, it indicates that it, there's buffing scratches left over. If he circles something, then it's a sink or a pinhole or an imperfection in the finish that needs to be sanded out. Austin marks on the side of the guitar what's wrong with it. That way when it hits the next step of repair, the guys know what needs to be fixed. Even though this guitar looks like it has a lot of markings on it, this is all part of the standard process for our high level of quality. The imperfections that Austin has marked up are so small that the camera can't even pick up on what we're seeing. So at this point, Austin's repairing the guitar, all the imperfections that he marked up, he's sanding with 1500 grit sandpaper and then putting it back in the rack to be final buffed. The direction of the guitar indicates what process it's at. For example, if the guitar is pointing right, it's ready for turnaround. If the guitar is pointing left, it's ready for final buff. That's Dalton. So Dalton grabs the guitar and brings it into the buffing room and Dalton's going to do the final buff process. So all the markings that Austin put on the guitar, Dalton's going to go back over the guitar and buff out everything that he marked up. Anything he might have sanded on, marked up for buffing scratches. So Dalton's on our cut wheels. Our cut wheels are what takes out the harsh scratches that might be on the guitars. After the cut wheels, it goes to the polish wheels. We use a liquid polish you put on the wheel, and then you buff the guitar out, and it takes all the compound and haze out of the guitar. When Dalton's done this, he puts it in the rack facing left, and that indicates that it's ready for its final QC inspection before it moves in the final assembly. Rob's about to pick the guitar up to do its final QC check before it moves into final assembly. Rob's goal is to look the guitar over for any imperfections and make sure we got everything at turnaround and repair. This is just another level of quality that we strive for at Paul Reed Smith Guitars. Rob knocks the hard finish off with 600 grit sandpaper and smooths that edge out for a nice round, for a nice round over on the veneer. Then we block the top of the veneer to make sure it's flat and get any finish off that may be left. Rob uses wax and grease remover to knock out any buffing compound that may be deep in the grain from the buffing room. Rob puts linseed oil on the fingerboard and goes back over it with furniture polish to give it that classic PRS shine. So after visual inspection, Rob takes the wire brush on the fingerboard to get out any compound dust that may be deep in the grain. Then we wipe the guitar off to make sure there's no linseed oil or furniture polish left on the finish. When Rob's done his visual inspection, he takes it over and puts it in the final assembly QC rack. This back-to-back -back QC process ensures that the guitar is absolutely perfect before it is ready to be assembled. If it does not pass the QC check, it comes back to the turnaround area to fix any kind of imperfection they may have found. Once it passes its final QC check, this is where it goes in the final assembly and that's when Carrie takes over. Thanks for hanging out with us in the Topcoat department.
Thanks, Josh. Um, my name is Carrie Pelchat. I'm the final assembly and electronics manager. I've been at PRS for about 15 years, and let's get to it. So this is Nancy Dennis. She is part of the kit room. What she's doing is printing out the paperwork and looking at the Mod Cat and what this particular guitar is calling for, and she grabs all the parts. She picks out the pickups, the drop-in, and the jacks, tuners. So after the kit is fully assembled and ready to go, she walks it out to the guitar that the kit is waiting for, places it there, and then the next step is the tuner installation guy who, this is Cole, he um, reams the headstocks, opens up the holes, make sure everything's reamed out good enough, no marks are left, and he also um, installs the grommets if needed. So the reason why we take the finish out of the holes is because Paul Smith would like everything to be touching pretty much bare wood. This helps with potentially more resonance with the instrument. So next we have JP. He is doing the other side of the pre-assembly work tuner bench. Um, he is reaming the bridge holes, opening them up just a little bit, enough so we can push those tiny plugs through. So this process, he is pushing out plugs. So we want as little finish as possible like inside those holes. The plugs do that for us so we can have the screws touch bare wood to make sure everything is connected very well. So he's pretty much opening, clearing out all this finish. He's um, installing the strap buttons. Hand tightening is important. We don't want any finish lifts. He's being very careful not to ding or damage this guitar. It comes through QC first, which is checked and looked over for any imperfections the guitar might have. So right now he's just installing the claw for the trim. So once JP is done with the guitar, he puts it back in the rack and then it is placed in the pre-assembly. The pre-assembler, this is Nick. He will grab the guitar once it's finished, bring it back to his bench, and start his pre-assembly process. As you can see, he has the kit with all the parts. Um, right now, he is installing the tuners. Here, he is waxing the bridge holes to make sure there's enough lubrication and they don't get stuck in the guitar, and then lays the bridge. So after installing the bridge, he is setting the claw height, and he will add the, for this particular model, Paizo, add five tremolo springs to the back. So here he is pretty much doing a roundabout bridge height for getting it ready for the setup guys. Um, our core models are at 230 seconds. And then here he is installing the piezo board. Um, here he is soldering the positive and negative to the battery door. Now he's installing the drop-in. So the piezo has a few extra steps for installation than a normal core model. You have to adjust the volumes, um, solder the board to the actual drop-in. So right now he's soldering the leads from the piezo to the volume pot. We like to tin our wires to help better stick to the components.
it's a bit of a process, but at the end of the day, this is to ensure everything works properly and functions correctly. So once all the soldering is complete, we do a tap test to ensure like everything works correctly. They test the volume, tone, um, we'll tap the individual saddles on the bridge, make sure everything has you know full sound, nothing sounds weak or isn't working properly. So after tap testing, he writes in his signature and signs off on it and hands the guitar to the setup guys. And then we have Joe Norton, he will grab the guitar and get ready for setup. He does a quick look over. And right now he's oiling the neck, um, removing any tape residue. So here he's scraping out um, any finish that might be in the nut slot. When we glue the nut, we want to make sure that the glue is actually connected to bare wood. Um, so here he's rough fitting the nut, um, taking off little as possible, trying to get the right height. He's testing the first fret height with feeler gauges to see if he might have to take any more off on the nut itself. And then going back and forth a little bit, trying to get the right height and making the nut look good by getting rid of any jagged edges, making sure there's no sharp corners, that it feels good, getting rid of any sanding scratches that there might be. Here he's adding the glue to the nut, making sure it's spread evenly to ensure good coverage. He's now pressing it on, making sure it's lined up. So we do use an accelerant and it's to help speed up the process a little more. Um, here he is scraping any glue that might have squeezed out between the nut and the fingerboard. So here he is installing the strings. Um, we use PRS signature strings on all of our Maryland made guitars, which by way are available at your PRS website. So here Joe is um, locking down the cap screws on the tuners. Um, he leaves a little bit of slack just so he can get a good wrap around the tuning peg. So he'll tune it the guitar up and make sure everything sounds and works right. So here um, he is scraping the end of the fingerboard to get rid of any glue that might be left or finish to ensure that the neck pickup sits flush against the fingerboard. He is now lining up the pickups to make sure they align with the neck and the strings of the guitar, so he's going to drill out the pickup mounting screws and then seat them. Uh, the measurements and assembly are very particular. Um, so now he's tuning up the guitar, making sure that they meet spec. He's adjusting um, the claw heights to make any adjustments that may be needed. Um, Joe is stretching the strings. He's tuning between each step. He's um, adjusting the relief, double checking again with the feeler gauges and readjusting relief if needed. This is sort of a back and forth process to get it um, exactly within Paul's specs. Something. Joe has been here for quite a while. He knows these guitars in and out. Joe has his capo directly on top of the first fret, so this helps make the relief measurements more accurate. Yep. So Joe is measuring the string height at the first fret. This helps him um, know whether or not to make any adjustments to the nut slots by filing. 
This is a back and forth process to make sure the guitar um, meets PRS specs, um, any cutting filing that may be needed. After Joe is done setting up the guitar, he's going to play test it, make sure all the electronics work, the pickup heights are adjusted to where they need to be, and then he's going to bring it over to test out the piezo system. He's also balancing the volumes between the magnetic and the piezo system. So once Joe's done um, checking and making any adjustments to the piezo, he brings the guitar back to his bench, writes a hang tag, filling everything out, he'll scan it to the computer and then he'll hand it off to QC, which they do pretty much in a whole nother entire inspection of the guitar. So this concludes, you know, the rest of the tour. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of the show. See you guys next time. Well, hey there, kids. It's your good buddy, Uncle Ben Eller, and I'm here with the brand new Paul Reed Smith Archon 50 Mark II, the perfect amp for people who like things that are nice. Whenever I found out that the newly redesigned Archon 50 was hitting the shelves, I was really excited to try it out because the Archon has long been PRS's flagship amp of brutality. And as soon as I got the amp, it was really easy to dial in a nice, saturated, tight, high gain sound. But then I started messing around with the EQ and the two channels and stuff and finding that this amp is capable of a lot more than just the heavy stuff. Let's start off here by talking about some of the clean tones that the amp has to offer because the clean channel on this is seriously amazing and it's not just you know good for a metal amp it's a legit fantastic clean channel But in my world, it's not enough just to have a nice, crystal clear, clean tone on an amp. It's also got to be able to take pedals well. That way we can push the amp into that elusive, kind of mid-gain territory that lives in between your clean and distorted sounds. I've got my hollow body here plugged into a clone of a well-known, obsessively clean overdrive pedal into the clean channel of the Archon 50. Should be exactly what we need for those in-between sounds.
But of course, the main attraction of the amp is that high gain lead channel. It seems like a lot of modern high gain amps are doing this like ultra compressed, ultra tight kind of thing all the time, which can be really cool, but it also severely limits the range of things you can do with that gain. For example, you can run the gain lower and the master volume higher for a more spongy old school sound. <laughs> The first thing that it reminded me of whenever I played it up is the tone from one of my favorite guitar players, otherworldly solo albums from back in the day. The amp has more than enough gain to take care of anything you throw at it, but I think one of the most important features of any high gain amp is its ability to take a boost pedal out front. A boost pedal can take a good amp from sounding nice and tight to sounding like a surgical killing machine in no time, but some amps don't really take boosts all that well. Fortunately for us, it takes pedals like a champ. Check this out. And of course, with all the gain that the amp has, as well as the flexible EQ, it's a cinch to conjure up some really epic, soaring lead tones. So there you go guys, the Paul Reed Smith Archon 50 Mark II, a valuable piece of my tone shaping arsenal in the studio and on the stage. Hey, what's up? I'm Corey Congilio. I'm a Nashville-based blues guitar player, online instructor, and proud PRS artist. Happy to be here today talking to you about a fun little blues rhythm concept we're going to play. And it's going to be a way to navigate your normal 12-bar blues with the chords you might already know that happen, like, oh, let's say, in the key of G, a G7, C7, D7. But we're going to break those down to chords that only have three strings. Now it's not a triad, it's still gonna be dominant seven chords, but they're played with really fun voicings that really make you sound, dare I say, more pro, okay? Like some of your favorite guitar players might play, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna play a blues in G. I'm gonna roll um, a little shot of me playing uh, two times through the 12 bar with these little three string chords, and then I'm gonna talk to you about how you can play them, where they come from, and what you can do to make them your own. All right, so let's jump in. We're gonna hear me play through two passes of the blues right here on my 594. I'm excited to, to do this with you guys. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it.
All right, so that's some of my favorite stuff to play. It's a lot of fun. It really feels like, oh man, I'm playing like a more pro guitar player now, playing these little these little pieces of chords. I'm like a keyboard player dropping them into the 12-bar blues. It's really fun. But what I like to do is make sure you really understand where things come from before we start dissecting and ripping them apart. So if you're playing a blues in G, there's a good chance you're going to be playing a G7 as your one chord, and a C7 of some variety as your four chord, and then a D7 of some variety as your five chord. Now those notes are made, those chords are made up of four notes. Uh, the first three are what's affectionately known as a triad, and then we throw in a note called the flat seven to give it that bluesy sound. So you might see uh, these kinds of sounds. There's your triad. We add that pinky note to the second string sixth fret, and then you get an F note that merely makes you have the sound of the G7. We could definitely go into this more in detail, but for now we're just gonna do a quick fun lesson. So if you played a G7 bar chord and added your pinky to the second string sixth fret, you'd have that note we need, okay? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep that note on the third string, fourth fret, and what I want you to do is we're gonna play that G fourth string fifth fret, but we're gonna change the fingering around and make it more comfortable. And we're just going to play the G, which is the root, fourth string, fifth fret, third string, fourth fret, that's your B, and then the F gets played. So that's only three notes. You're like, well, you're leaving one out. That's okay. When you have these kinds of chords, you can play these fragments of these shapes, and it still has all the integrity of a G7, right? So that's the first shape I played, and you could play it first, or sorry, second, first, pinky, or you could play it second, first, third, but the pinky always works well for me. It's more comfortable. So that is a small little baby G7. And then you can do another one and flip it all around, do what we call invert the notes. Now, check this bar chord out again, right? So the chord is going to live inside of that bar chord, but it's only going to be on the fourth string. Third string again, there's your third, that's your B note of the chord. And now we add the D on the second string, third fret. So our notes are F, B, and D. If the bass player is playing the G, like they probably should be, <laughs> you're gonna have a nice kind of G7 chord between the two of you, okay? And you can see that those notes are in that chord, I just play them individually as opposed to a bar. So what I did in the first part of that little progression is I went, and you can go between those two and you're still playing G7, as opposed to, Nothing wrong with this. But it's a little meaty, it's a little chunky, takes up a lot of space. We can go three, three. We can slide in. Now we want to go to our four chord. And we're gonna make this sort of even easier to see because we're going to take a C7 bar shape there on the third fret, fifth string, starting there's your C. But we're just gonna remove that note and play these three strings, strings four, three, and two, strings five, four, five, three, and five, yeah, frets. <laughs> Gets confusing every once in a while. Frets five, three, five, strings four, three, two. Those notes will be G, B flat and E, and they all live inside of that chord anyway, so we can just take pieces of them. What's really cool is when we're going back to that chord, or that chord, we get to that one, right? So we've all this beautiful half-step movement happening now, and now we're like a keyboard player. Do you ever see a really great keyboard player that kind of plays with their hands like almost handcuffed? That's what they're doing. So we have two G7s to recap. To our C7, and now we're gonna take a D7 shape. And what we're going to play is an F sharp there on the fourth string, fourth fret, that's your second finger. The third finger is playing a C note that is actually the flat seven of the D chord. And then the first finger is playing the root, that's the D. So we have F sharp, C, and D. Bass player plays that. 
we're in good shape. But look how close we are now to that three string guy. Back to that one. So you can hear with these three little shapes, you can get a lot of mu music happening. Three, four. Maybe play, take your shape for D, move it down a whole step, back to G's. Okay, so these are really fun things to explore. I do a lot of this stuff uh, online in guitar courses and on my YouTube channel. And if you'd like to learn more about that, please jump over to my website, coreycongilio.com. Check out my YouTube channel, which is also by my same name. And there's lots more that we can talk about to extend this conversation even more. But this is a great sort of primer to say, there's more out there than just big, beefy bar chords and open chord shapes. This is like, not the next level, but the next, next level, right? I've taught lots of stuff on this in the past and I'd love to share it with you guys. And it's been an absolute honor to be asked by PRS and the staff to, uh, to really be involved in something that I've watched from afar for a long, long time. And I hope to be involved for years to come. Um, again, more like this can be found on my website, my YouTube channel, and of course, Please stick around and watch everyone here presenting really, really great stuff. Thanks again. I'm Corey Congilio. I'll see you on the next lesson. Hi everybody, I'm Justin Derrico, uh, and I'm here to show you how this um, Paul Reed Smith amp, um, I'm gonna pull some tones out of this bad boy. Um, it's the <clears throat> HX50, um, it's, so it's, it's modeled after uh, one of Hendrix's uh, actual Marshalls. Uh, so obviously it's a Marshall style amp. And uh, I'm gonna pull some, some sounds out of it. Um, not Hendrix sounds uh, necessarily, but because um, we, we know it does that, right? So I'm gonna do like an Eric Johnson type, uh, type thing. So uh, I've got a tone dialed in right now. Um, and I'll show you guys a close up, but right now I've got the presence at right around two, the bass right around two, the middle's at four. This diff switch is a, like a high mid boost. Um, I've got it up, and I've got um, the treble at four. I got the treble volume all the way up, and the bass volume all the way up. Uh, almost, actually, it's it's just below ten. But and and I've got this dip switch here um, all the way up, which is a bright switch, because um, the the tone's pretty pretty dark. You know what I mean? It Right, so that's that's sort of my my starting point, um, but I've got a couple pedals here that I'm going to add in. Uh, I've got a uh, a BK Butler tube driver, um, which is you know Eric Johnson's famous for for using that. Um, I guess that's a big part of his sound, and I've got a Wampler Ego um, compressor, and just to kind of give me that 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 attack, and I'm also going to add some some delay here. Uh, I know that's. I'm coloring it quite a bit, but you know, in order to, to um, sort of get these sounds, you know, we need these pedals, and it's also a cool way to show you how the amp takes pedals um, and plugins, I guess. Um, so right now I've got an Echoplex uh, dialed in already, and um, and yeah, so this is what that's what that sounds like. So, so that's the sound so far. That's that's the, the, the our starting point. I'm gonna add in the tube driver. So, 
that's already pretty pretty Eric Johnson-y, um, you know. <laughs> going for us. Uh, when I add the compressor in, this, this is going to give it a little bit more of that attack. Um, That's 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 basically it. Um, you know, it's not going to make you play like Eric Johnson. I mean, I you know I can I can kind of try, but I don't really quite have uh, his amazing talent. So, um, and this is I'm using the Silver Sky, obviously, and for the uh, the mic that I'm using, it's a SM57, um, and it's just slightly like see the cone is here. And it's just kind of pointed right there, um, at, at, you know, it's close. And my, my cabinet's in an ISO box, and it's, I'm using a, a 112 um, Celestian uh, V30. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's what you're hearing. So, and it's a 16-ohm cabinet, in case you care. This next uh, tone setting that I'm going to do is um, probably the king of all tones. So uh, please be nice in the comments because, um, yeah, I'm sure I'll get berated. Uh, but it is what it is, man. You know, I'm just trying to get um, um, close uh, the essence of these guys, you know. Um, but anyways, I'm, I'm going to try to get a, a Stevie Ray Vaughan tone um, from um, Scuttle Button. So anyways, um, got the Silver Sky here. And I've got, um, again, I've got, I'm going to add a pedal in there, but I'll show you how this, um, how the amp sounds, um, without the pedal. And then, uh, I'll add that in. Um, uh, but anyways, so, um, we'll talk about this real quick. I've kind of cranked the presence up to 10 here. Um, maybe a little bit much, but we'll, we'll play with it a little bit. Um, I've got the bass at four. I've got the middle cranked as well. Plus this thing's all the way up. Kind of actually a lot opposite from what we had going on with the uh, Eric Johnson thing. Um, so yeah, the, the the middle's on just it's just a little bit past eight. The the high mid thing's up again. The treble's up at uh I'd say seven. And this uh, the the treble volume's up around four i mean i might crank it a little bit i know stevie loved to be loud right um you know he wanted from what i understand um you know everybody's chasing after stevie's tone for all these years so what do i know but <clears throat> i know that he liked to crank it you know but um have a very loud sound he, i think he used um you know his Marshall style uh, amp was was like a very you know, a very clean hundred watt um, uh, Marshall amp. I'm not sure exactly which one it was, but um, you know, so I've heard. Um, and anyways, he would crank it, and you know, it was still pretty clean. This thing, if you crank it, it it's it's gonna break break up the amp a little too much. So I left that back, and then the bass um, volumes down a little bit because it was adding a little bit too much low end when I was trying to dial it in, and I, I took the bright switch, um, it's in the middle, because you have like off, bright one, and bright two, so I'm on bright one, um, and that's where I'm at. So, um, here's without, I'm gonna, I was gonna add a, a tube screamer, uh, the Ibanez, the old trusty, uh, tube screamer, which, by the way, um, any Marshall style amp and a tube screamer is always a win um, for lead sounds. I think it, you know. Uh, right now, the way I've got the um, 
tube screamer set up, it's I've got the the level cranked, um, and uh, and I've got the gain almost at zero. I mean, it's maybe it's actually I should look at it. I think it's at actually like like probably like one, just a little bit of gain, but it's mostly just pushing the front end of the amp, and then um, the tone I think is just in the middle. Um, so anyway, so here's without. Um, without the uh, Tube Screamer, right? So... Right? That sounds pretty good. And this Tube Screamer might... Um, Add a little bit more gain than I really want, uh, but it gives it that mid that mid range honky thing. Um, and again, I'm on the uh, this second pickup. I couldn't really tell. I'm going back and forth between this. Um, and this. Um, cause it's really kind of bitey and poking out and, and there's a live recording that I'm, I'm taking it from. So, you know, I, it's somewhere in the ballpark. It's one of those, this on its own to me sounds pretty good. But I think when the band kicks in, it's pretty badass. Um, so here's the, um, the tube screamer. Um, Yeah, kind of messed that up a little bit, but that's okay. That's not the point here. Um, anyways, that's that's a really cool. That's a really cool sound. Um, uh, it's very Stevie. Pull it back. That sounds good. Uh, and again, you know, this, uh, it's, it's not going to make you play like Stevie because <laughs> he's, you know, who's better than Stevie. Uh, but it's, it's, it's close again. And, and like I said, I'm trying to get capture just sort of the essence, um, you know, Especially like a lot of what I do on the voices, I'm always trying, I'm always trying to, to get close to the sounds. You know, you, there, there's only so much you can do to uh, to get to it. I mean, at the end of the day, you sound the way you sound. You'll always sound the way you sound, um, and that's kind of the beauty of it, right? Um, and that's 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 why it makes Stevie and Eric Johnson so unique and, and amazing. Um, is that they have amazing sounding hands, and they're just straight up badasses. So. And that's why we're uh, copying their sounds, because they're bad as shit. So anyways, um, awesome. Thank you guys. Hey guys, Tyler Larson here. I hope you're enjoying Experience PRS 2021. And we have a jam break for you. We are in the key of E minor, the most glorious of all guitar keys. This is actually the rhythm section with all the lead guitars taken out of a tune that I recorded a little while back called Thunder in the Ocean. It's an incredibly fun chord progression to jam over. We actually have three different sections, but the whole thing you can just blast your E minor pentatonic or your E natural minor, and whatever else you can come up with. If it sounds good, it is good. Without further ado, I'll take the rhythm you take the lead.
My name is Aiden Ewald. I'm here with Brian Ewald. Um, I've been fortunate enough to help him out with some of these PRS demo jams over the years, and today we're going to do another one, this time in the key of C major, uh, which is the same as A minor. So you can follow along playing with the C major pentatonic scale or the A minor pentatonic scale. Uh, there is one funky chord in this progression that does go out of key a little bit, but he's going to put some things on the screen to show you what you can play along with it. So, sounds good. Ready to get her started? One, two. The chairs. <laughs> yeah, it's what? All right, we're good. The upstairs of the PRS factory is home to our SE and amplifier teams. In this section of our factory, our SE inspectors carefully review every SE guitar, bass, and acoustic brought into the building and our amplifier team designs, builds, and inspects PRS amplifiers. PRS first started offering amplifiers in 2009. We now offer a robust assortment of amplifiers to suit a variety of players. We offer vintage and modern designs, single and multi-channel amp models, and models ranging from 15 to 100 watts. Just like the rest of the PRS factory, communication, teamwork, and attention to detail are paramount to what we do. Building quality tools, for musicians to do their jobs. We are excited to show you what we do. This is From the Factory Floor, the SE Series, and PRS Amplifiers. We hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Doug Scheib. I'm the SE Operations Manager. I've been working with SE Guitars since 2000, and I've been with PRS Guitars since 1995. Today we're going to watch Tom Walls, our lead SE inspector, go through the inspection process of an SE guitar. All SE series instruments that ship inside of North America are inspected at our Maryland factory. We have a team of inspectors that will inspect all electric guitars, bass guitars, and our SE series acoustic instruments. Tom's removing the guitar, getting it ready for inspection. Each guitar ships in a moisture barrier bag so it's safer in transport and the guitar he's getting ready to inspect is one of our custom 24 models with a tremolo. Uh, each guitar requires a little bit different process depending on if it's a stop tail, if it's a bass, it's an acoustic. So it, it's, the process isn't exactly the same for each model. The, the process begins uh, with a visual inspection. We're making sure the, the paint looks good, no debris in the finish, uh, no scratches, burns. We want it to look as good as possible. 
first thing we do is take the truss rod cover off so we can adjust the truss rod. We want to make sure it works properly. That has to work just right or the rest of the setup doesn't really matter a whole lot. So we start there. We want to check the tension on the tuners, make sure they feel right, not too tight, not too loose. What Tom's doing there is making sure that the lock nuts are tight on the headstock, checking for the fit of the nut, making sure the frets are smooth, not sticking out. Uh, no, not really. Sometimes it is loose and then put a trem arm in there, check the tension on the trem arm, um, making sure the intonation screws are not loose and making sure that the tremolo moves properly and freely. What he's doing here is checking the height of the plate of the tremolo over top of the body to make sure it has proper clearance. Slight adjustments to the knife edge screws, make sure that the tremolo block is level to the body. And then just a quick check of the electronics to make sure it sounds sounds right is tuning it up right here also important before doing a, a setup we want to make sure it's in tune otherwise a tremolo guitar well it doesn't work too well if you don't tune it first when Tom's not inspecting guitars he acts as the mayor of Dobbinsville Delaware little known fact And what he's doing here is checking the relief. We use a capo and some feeler gauges to do a, a min, min and max spec. Make sure the, uh, the action is just right. It's important to set the, the uh, relief on the neck before we do any other adjustments. So once the guitar is tuned and then the, the relief is set, then he'll check the, uh, the other specs. And the reason Tom's putting the capo on the, on the, at the first fret is that it um, negates any issues that may be present with the uh, slots on the nut. We know how high the first fret is, so we adjust off of that. And we'll come back then later and check the, the height of the strings at the first fret. And that's what he's checking right there with the digital gauge. And that shows if the slots need to be deepened it off. If they haven't been cut deep enough, we can go back and, and set that. Really the same process that we do on the U.S. guitars, and the specs are uh, basically the same as well. The goal is to get a, an, an SE guitar that looks and feels like a U.S. guitar as close as possible. We want the experience to be very similar. Guitars come in pretty well set up, but we like to make them just right so that when the dealer receives the guitar, it feels like one of the U.S. guitars. Rechecking the height of the first fret with the digital gauge. It's very accurate. It's the, it's the best way we can ensure that every guitar is consistent. And now checking the height at the 12th fret. So again, the, the relief has been set, the first fret action has been set, and now what he's doing there is adjusting each saddle just a little bit to dial it in. In fact, the strings are not set at the same height on each string. It varies slightly. It, the, the action is a little bit higher on the low string, a little, a little tighter on the high E string. If you set the action too low on that, on that big fat string, when it swings in its arc, when you strike it, it'll tend to buzz. So you set the fatter strings a little bit higher than the skinny strings. Checking the relationship of the pickup to the string. If it's too close, it'll cause magnetic interference. It'll create wolf tones, doesn't sound good. If it's too far away from the strings, it's just weak. So you've got to find that sweet spot and we have a spec for that. 
once again tuning it, stretching the strings is important. Um, new strings always need to be stretched a bit, especially with a tremolo guitar. So we'll tune it, stretch them, and do it a couple times. We often hear the guitars arrive from our factory completely in tune and ready to play, and dealers are always amazed at that. We think it's just pretty normal here. No matter where it ships, it should, it should arrive ready to play out of the bag. Checking intonation here. Tom likes to play a lot of notes. He's checking to see if there's any buzz. You can hear some buzz if, if the frets aren't level. If the frets aren't level, we can fix it. We can dress the frets as necessary. All right, all the setup is complete. Put the truss rod cover back on, and then a quick wipe down, get all the fingerprints off of it. Want it to, to arrive at the dealer nice and clean. And then a hang tag. Each one is signed and dated by the inspector, just like the US guitars. Got a headstock protector we're going to put on top of the headstock to help protect it during shipping. Warranty card is placed in the bag. Always double check that the tremolo arm is in the bag if it's a tremolo guitar. Truss rod wrench. That's going to go on the pallet ready to put into inventory. This may not be the last stop for this guitar. On Fridays, we randomly choose three guitars to be inspected by the core guitars quality control folks. In the QC meeting, we use the same specifications when checking the guitars. We do a visual inspection, and then check all the setup specs. It's always been our goal to make SE guitars sound great, play great, and look great, just like our core guitars. Thanks for joining us on this small tour of the SE department, and now it's time for Doug Sewell to show you around the amp department. Hello, I'm Doug Sewell, the senior amp designer at PRS Guitars. I have been working with PRS for 14 years and officially been here in Maryland for 13 years. I met Paul at a trade show um, in Dallas. Uh, I had my own amp company there for 10 years and uh, we uh, struck up a great friendship and working relationship and um, the rest is history. Um, we'd like to dig into our amp department and uh, see what's going on with uh, what we are currently doing uh, with PRS amps. Well, here we are in the R&D room, uh, Jason Morjan and I. Uh, we um, do all our designs here in Maryland. Um, they're all tube designs. Um, we do single and multi-channel platforms. We run the gamut with tones, vintage to modern tones. Um, uh, we um, and do combos and head configurations. We use literally seven different kinds of software to produce these designs in-house. We design for domestic building and we design for imported building equal, equally. There's Paul, he's coming in with us, uh, very involved, very involved with us. Uh, he, um, uh, we truly collaborate with, uh, with, with these designs. He, he'll test materials, capacitors um, at home even, and, and give me results. We try them out together, and it's, it's really um, a cool collaboration that we're doing. And it, it was from day one uh, when, we, when we first met. You can see the, just a brief small collection of tubes that we have tried and used and will use. Um, you know, we'll have um, multiple styles of capacitors and resistors to try. Um, here are some examples of circuit boards. This happened to be the, the new Archon amp 
those are all the different variations of, uh, of the uh, circuit board that we, that we uh, process through the, uh, through the design development. Here's Harry, um, he's um, unpackaging some of our import amps. That happens to be an Archon 2 combo and uh, we um, inspect every one of them. Harry's great with hearing any little uh, problems with anything. He can solve them real quickly. We might need to change a tube or rebias, but um, Harry is uh, fantastic at this and uh, uh, always um, gets them rock solid before we uh, repackage them for shipments. Here's Harry checking the uh, tones on both channels. Um, he has his own uh, sound booth so it doesn't have any interference. He can hear any kind of background noise, hums. Here's Jeff Taylor assembling a, an HX amp. Um, we use um, old school methods, hand wired. It's just beautiful work that Jeff does. He's been with us from day one. He's got the most experience um, of our assemblers. Um, and uh, the uh, work he does is beautiful. If you ever get to see an interior shot of an HX anywhere on the, on the web, you can see Jeff's work. Our construction methods are all overbuilt. We, uh, we do use PC boards a lot, but uh, we try to emulate the old point-to-point -point wiring uh, concepts that, that were used for as much robustness as possible, but with consistent uh, behaviors between amp to amp. As you can see, we um, used purple for the uh, boards on the inside, just an homage to uh, purple haze, I guess. And uh, I think uh, everybody realizes that those purple boards sound much better than, than other colors. As you can see, the, um, the um, chassis, we, we have some close specs where we, even with import amps or domestic amps, we use the same belt and sockets. Um, we use the same cliff jacks um, uh, throughout all of our designs who just feel like those are the things you don't want to compromise on. We see Jeff installing a logo on the speaker. You can see the speakers that, we, uh, that we're installing uh, into the uh, cabinet. Uh, we take great pains in how we design the speaker cabinets. Paul has some uh, ideas that he's actually brought over from guitars about wood to wood contact and things to make the uh, speaker more lively sound sounding. And we spend nearly as much design in the, in the speaker cabinets as we do the uh, actual chassis and uh, amplifiers. Here we are with the Pierre's Golden Sample Rack. If you've been to one of our factory tours before, you've seen these. These are um, amps that we have designed over the years uh, that are prime examples of the tone and performance that uh, we would use against all others uh, that we build. Uh, Paul has approved and listened to all these uh, units and um, we are confident if we pull one out, that is a prime example of what, an, what, what our older amps would sound like. And we can judge any new amp that we build against it. And it comes in very handy uh, for just looking at the components back then, anything that might have changed uh, between a, a new version and the old version. After Jeff finishes a domestic amp and he um, uh, uh, makes sure it's all working properly, We'll put them in a burn-in rack and we burn them in for several hours. And then we check them again after the burn-in rack and rebias. And here's Jeff testing an amp that we have just gone through the burn-in process. Um, a lot of times uh, test equipment can catch certain things, but these guys have so much experience that I'd trust their ears over anything. So um, here he is uh, just doing the final play test on one of our domestic amps. It's been a pleasure uh, giving this virtual tour with you. Uh, if you can, check out our newest amps that we have uh, available, the Archon and the HX amps. And stay tuned for cool amps coming out that we're working on right now. Thanks very much.
I'm Tennille Arts. As you can see, I've got my acoustic PRS here. Um, I've got another PRS acoustic and um, an electric, but I prefer to write on acoustic. So I'm going to share with you guys some tips and tricks that I've learned over my years of songwriting and also walk you through how I wrote my song, Somebody Like That. So to kick it off, I just wanna say that there's no right or wrong way to write a song. There's definitely a formula that you can follow, but songwriting is art, so if you like it, just, just keep doing what you're doing, but I just wanted to share some things that have helped me. So first of all, there's kind of a, a formula to writing songs, especially in country music, which is what I write, and it's typically verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, and typically the chorus is your general idea, just the overall thought that you want to get across to the listener. Your verses are much more detailed. You know, you just can go into the storytelling, all of that. Any detail that you want to share goes in the verses. And then the bridge is really fun because you can kind of choose what you want to do there. You can share some new information that you haven't said before. You can have a complete scene change. Um, in country music, they say <laughs> that's when uh, somebody gets killed. <laughs> so uh, you can literally uh, decide whatever you want to do. It's your story, your song, tell it how you want to. So after that, you know, songwriting really just all starts with the idea. So you can have a formula all day, but if you don't have a great idea, it's probably not gonna be a great song. So always try to start with an awesome idea or a thought or a feeling that will kind of lead you somewhere. So for me, I get ideas from all over the place, you know? Um, I've gotten ideas from watching TV, I've gotten ideas from books, I've gotten ideas from my own life, from conversations, uh, from listening to people, um, you know, people watching and listening to conversations, it's really, you know, you can get song ideas from absolutely anywhere. I've even had ideas, uh, woken up from a dream and had an idea. So it's really important though that you write those ideas down because you'll think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna remember and you definitely won't. <laughs> I have done that way too many times. So always write down your ideas. And if you have a melody or a melodic idea or a guitar idea, Make sure you take out your phone and record it. I just constantly click record on voice memo and sing ideas and, you know, even just talk through song ideas into my phone so that I have that to go back to because it's really hard <laughs> to remember some ideas and some melodies because there's endless possibilities. So make sure you're recording. And a trick that I've learned for guitar because I grew up not knowing how to play guitar. I actually learned from videos like this 
just sitting down and, and learning different songs and watching tutorials and videos. So um, I didn't grow up knowing guitar and it changed my life when I sat down and was actually able to play and accompany myself. So basically all you need to know are like three or four chords. If you're just starting out on guitar, that's all you need to know. Country music is three chords and the truth. So uh, you can, basically get by and learn anything and uh, write anything just knowing those few chords so that's a great place to start and after that if you're kind of stuck figuring out what chords you want to play or a, a vibe or a feeling that you want to give off something that i do every once in a while when i feel like i'm stuck is i go and find the chords or learn a song that I love and I love the feeling of it and that's kind of a song that I want to write, I will learn those chords and then take them into the song that I want to write. So you can alter them, definitely don't straight up copy it, but you can alter them in a way to get that same feeling of that song that you love and that's a great place to start if you're feeling stuck. I'm going to talk about my song Somebody Like That right now and share with you how we wrote this song and, and how it came to be because sometimes it's just better to, to actually see these tips and tricks in action. So um, for me, I always tune my guitar down half a step. It's just kind of a habit that I've been in. I feel like for my voice, I write a ton of songs um, half a step down. So that's a great way to maybe just give it a little bit more range. Um, for the song, Somebody Like That, we got the idea from talking with each other and sharing our life. So for me, I love just getting to know my co-writers if I am in a co-writing situation, just getting to know them and sharing some, some things about your own life can really open up the room to some great ideas. So we came up with the title, Somebody Like That, because I had gone through a breakup and was really just not wanting to write another sad song. I wanted to write something hopeful about looking for love again and we just started talking about our grandparents and our you know parents and our, our friends around us that had great relationships and you know I said I want to find something just like that and we came up with this idea so the chorus goes like this I want that old It's like a very uplifting melody and that's what we wanted to uh, have come across when we when we played that chorus that melody we wanted it to match that that feeling and have those lyrics all kind of go together so that's how we came up with that chorus and then the first verse and the second verse are really those details that I talked about earlier so we wanted to talk about all the ways that people meet somebody and how, you know, it doesn't really matter how you meet them. It just matters if it's real and if you make it last. So this is what we wrote for the first verse. I've seen pickup lines and dive bar strangers slow dance. I've seen happy hour two for once turn to one night stands. I've seen neon rebounds, late night drunk dive. melody to make it feel really great in the chorus and I want that all in for
anyway, I hope you guys have learned a little bit from this. Thank you so much for tuning in and thank you, PRS. Okay, everybody, what's up? This is Isaiah Sharkey here with PRS Guitars. Uh, I got my Silver Sky here, and we're going to talk about playing outside of the box. Um, there's so many cool things that you can do, so many different concepts that can kind of bring you, you know, different ideas out of the norm. And that's what we always look for, right? We always look for things that would make something sound, I guess, kind of cooler, you know? Uh, so... Um, what I want to do is, is just basically talk about that. So let's say, for instance, we'll do the key of A, right? And we're doing a blues, you know, standard blues progression you got. This little solo stuff, right? We could do. Right? Standard blues. Then we go to the four. If you notice, I stuck to the good old faithful box shape, right? Where you have <clears throat> uh, the pentatonic, right? We're in A. Right? And I did the same thing on the four. But we don't have to stick to that. Even that on when he did the three, six, two, five progression. We can make it more interesting than that. So how can we do that? Well, let's just, let's narrow it down even more. Let's say one, four, five, right? If we say. Now in music, we have cool things called like passing tones. So uh, straight, instead of going right to the four, you know, to the one, to the four, and go. I can go up a half step, which would be technically uh, the flat at five or E flat if we're in the key of A. So instead of, I could take the same phrase that I did on the four and do it right before I go to the four, and I can get back into the pentatonic thing if I want to. So it'll be a thing like on the one. passing tone half step up from the four and I could do that same phrase that I would do on a four on a half step up right then it's then I could do the same so this is what it would sound like now check this out one two three what's our box right passing tone Just did a half step up. See? But I don't have to do the same phrase twice, obviously. But if I just go. See, I'm right at the four. So that gives you a different color. Okay, another thing you can do, if you're going to the five, instead of doing that whole. 
right? Well, there's another passing tone. You just want to get back to the one, right? If you want to, you know, blues. So if I say, uh, we're going to include that passing tone to the four. Instead of doing the five, if I'm already on the two, I can just go a half step down and do like a major nine. And do like, you know, a scale on that or a line on that. See that? So now, so we're going to the three. Now back at the one, you see that? So you don't have to stick to, so the whole thing. My name is Clint Lowry. I'm with the band Seven Dust, and welcome to the PRS virtual experience for 2021. I'm happy to be here. Uh, today, I'm just going to demonstrate um, some alternative tunings that I use when I write songs. A lot of songs that I've written for Seven Dust are kind of in this format. And uh, for me, it's just enhanced a little bit of my options. Uh, sometimes in the traditional tunings, I just kind of get stuck in a rut. So there was one time that I was actually trying, I was hearing this harmonic and it was something I really wanted to get. And so I just kind of adjusted the tuning to you know, facilitate that. And it actually became something I just kind of kept around. And uh, it just kind of creates a kind of a drone or, you know, kind of creates this like a string skipping technique without actually having to do all that extra work. So yeah, as you can tell, it's And the actual tuning is A sharp. I'll tune while I'm doing it. A sharp, F, A sharp, D sharp, F, A sharp. So that configuration we've done in, in actual drop B, we've done it in C, uh, but this one uh, today is going to be an A sharp. So I put kind of put together a riff that I'll play for you um, and just kind of demonstrate how I use this tuning in songs and how it kind of creates a just a different option so to speak so let me play for that's the riff i'm going to play it with the track are you ready let's go So it's kind of cool. You kind of get a little bit of a, um, the, just the harmonic is really the, the special part. You kind of move it around. So I really love those dissonant. It's kind of notes. It's just, it's cool. So it's a little easier to achieve in this tuning. 
So you can also improvise over that. Um, you know, I have a little section here where I kind of just, you know, if you want to really just improvise, it's really cool. To Move this over here. And let's just improvise a little bit. Just have fun with it. It's kind of cool in, in terms of soloing it kind of creates the same kind of cool little alternative options and a little more out of the traditional uh, configuration. So that being said, I wrote another section just to kind of expand. So we see what the riff is. So it's kind of cool, you kind of, it's just really cool. It gives you, um, you know, that very, that it's almost called, I call it a tension note. And it's just really cool uh, additive if you're going for that very, um, that's kind of a stab note that just kind of sticks out. Um, and here I put in, you know, I'll share a screen so you can see, but I've added um, little guitar parts here that, you know, harmony guitar parts just kind of adds to it. And that's really, I just put a delay on and I just kind of find a texture. And I'll play with it. It's just kind of cool to play around with. Um, I'm a big fan of those overdubs and just ways to expand the riff. Um, so for another exercise in the same spirit of the song, but very broken down, I thought it'd be kind of cool to really uh, demonstrate the harmonic element that is such a cool bonus to this tuning. Let me find it here. And you'll hear just the melod melodic sensibility here. So. just really pretty um and those are the kind of things where it could be aggressive riff it can be a melodic riff but generally it's just having that drone note is what i call it these it's just very pretty it's a cool option so again here's that Thing. I'm going to play along with the main riff. So.
and that's pretty much it. It's just, um, you know, it's it's something that put in your arsenal. Um, you can try any configuration, really. It doesn't really matter. It's uh, some people get, you know, seven string guitars, eight string guitars to kind of, you know, simulate this or, you know, just open up options as well there. So I've always been a big fan of these alternative tunings. They've been a huge part of my career, my riff writing and just ways to stay inspired and stay engaged and uh, just just a beautiful uh, option, man. There are no rules to me. There are there aren't any uh, set theories that just you have to stick to. I mean, there's beautiful things about theory, but there's also cool things about going going off the beaten path and just trying new things. So I hope this was cool, and I hope it was um, something you can add on to your playing and your writing. And uh, that's it. Again, Clint Lowry here, PRS, amazing guitars. This is my signature with a little bit of the artwork from my, my family, my kids, and my wife. So it's been awesome. I hope you've had a great uh, experience so far. See ya. <laughs>
difficult this time. Hi everyone. It's Paul. We're having a bit, a bit, a little, bit, little bit of a technical difficulty, but I hope you enjoyed the experience. You know, we love opening our doors to you. I want to send a thank you out to all the artists for all the clinics, all their time, all the people here behind the scenes that made this work. You know, usually our event takes a year to plan. It's 4,000 people in it. 4,000 people in a tent and we do it in our parking lot and we show our broad offering of product and um, we recommend how you should look for a guitar. We think that you should look at everything online, look at all the videos, get your hands on as many guitars as you can and see which of the guitars speaks to you. Now as I understand it, there was a contest run a hundred thousand people were asked 15 questions and I'm supposed to guess at what the answers were and what the percentages were. Now this is a contest in me being about as wrong as I've ever been in my life, which is a good way to end an experience. So the first question would be, what would you reach for, a double cut or a single cut? Well I would say double cut, but I think the world may be, I don't know, 50-50, double cut, single cut. Okay, so it was double cut 61% and single cut 39%. I'm not being showing these answers ahead of time. Let's go for the next question. What's your neck choice, mahogany or maple? Once again, I'd say mahogany, but 50-50. And they said, oh, I'm close. Mahogany 47, maple 53%. Oh, that was good. Maybe I'm not so wrong. Here we go. Favorite tube amp. Oh, favorite amp type, excuse me, tube or solid state. 95% tube, 78% tube, I'm wrong, 22% solid state. Well, guess what? I guess I'm an old guy. <laughs> Settle the debate. Woods have unique tone. Tone wood is a myth. You got to be kidding me, right? Woods have a unique tone. I, I can prove it. Just go into the vault. All right, 77% of the people said it. they do have a unique tone, and tone wood is a myth, 23%. i tell you what, use balsa wood, call me. Next. <laughs> How many frets on your guitar, 22 or 24? I'd say it's 70% 22 and 30% 24. Oh, backwards. Paul, you are wrong. How many frets on your guitar, 22, have 38%, 24 frets, 62%. That was about as color us curious is the question stained maple or opaque finish 50 50. i'm wrong again stained maple 69 percent opaque finish 31 percent i told you this was going to be an exercise of me being wrong what's your setup pedals or straight into the amp well now hang on a minute i'm straight into the amp but everybody's going to say pedals 90 percent pedals 67% pedals wrong again, Paul, straight to the hip, 33%. I'm not doing so good. What's your preference, factory relic or worn in scars, road-worn scars? I don't like putting war wounds in babies. I think they should be road-worn scars, but I'd say 30% mm, relic, 70% road-worn scars. And the answer is, oh, I got that one right. <coughs> Dead on the money, 30, 70. I'm good, that one I got right. Style of neck, set in neck, that means glued in and bolt on. Ah, I'd go with the glued in, but I'd say 50-50. I'm wrong, 61% glued in, 40% bolt on. All right, well, I'm back. I got video. Here we go. Next question. Favorite musical decade, 60s or 70s? I won't answer that. The 2020s. Sorry, next question. Next. Favorite, what's your preference? A McCarty 594 or Silver Sky? If I'm playing a gig, I go with the McCarty, but I love Silver Sky's 50 50. 50 50. I got that one right. All right, here we go. You, a uh, colorist curious, faded whale blue or McCarty Sunburst? Uh, I'd go with McCarty Sunburst, but faded whale blue is a color that I think I came up with. So, 50 50. 61, faded whale blue, 39, McCarty burst, not bad. What's your, look, satin finish or gloss finish? Mm, gloss finish, 70%. 50-50, wrong again, Paul. Next. 
thought on aliens, absolutely real, no way, 80% real, 20% no way. I got it right, 76, 24, okay, here we go, next. Pineapple on pizza. It says, yeah, or big no, neither. I will refuse to answer the question, what's the percentage? 50-50, next. Experience PRS, 2021. Jack and Jamie, come join me, come on. Please come, everybody. So from all of us, it's good night, right? Yep. Come on, Jack. Yep, we did want to put one reminder in, yeah. uh, the, uh, the Joe Walsh package, Reverb. Um, the Hopkins gang has been so extraordinary working with us and us working with them. It's such a great relationship. Super important to us that uh, we treat them well for this event. Please get on Reverb, check out that package. So we're giving it away for charity, the good Joe Walsh guitar. Yeah, there's a Joe Walsh oh, guitar great. and his uh, Nothing box Nothing better than set. Hopkins, box that's set. great. Yep. Yep. So thank you from Jack. Thank so, you thank from you Jack. Thank you from Jamie. Thank you from Jamie. Thank you from Paul for the experience thank you from Paul. PRS 2021. Look, there was a huge crew of people behind the scenes here at PRS that made this happen. And we want to thank all of them. We want to thank all the yep. artists. We want to thank everybody. Great job. Wow. Been a good night. I've been checking the numbers. You're doing good, Judy. Your whole team did good today. Very well done. Awesome job. All right, bye. See ya. We're done. Thank you. We're done. Goodbye. It's over. Good night.